chapter four, the fortune, the favors, and the food. Leaving the church and heading towards the home of Ismark and his father, once on the streets again, however, Celine heard the sound of a woman sobbing horribly. After some debate, the group decided to check in on the woman who didn't answer the door when they knocked. They found the woman, who introduced herself as Mari. She explained she was distraught because her daughter was taken by that monster. In the weeks leading up to her disappearance, Gertrude had talked of seeing a wonderful man who came to her window in the night, upstairs and visited her. She left the night before. The party found out that Gertrude was a grown woman, but also played with dolls. This one saying, is no fun, is no blinksy. They convinced Mary to let them have the doll and hoped that the newfound dog could help sniff out the girl. They left the grieving woman there in the home, and went on to handle their own business. Passing the inn in which they had slept the night before, the party spied a line of people, the most they had seen in fact, out near a handcart. The simple cart was being steered by an older woman with a great deal of spirit. Morganatha. She spotted the group immediately and called them over into the front of the line to offer them free samples of her pies. Explaining since they are new around here, the first pie is free. The adventurers greedily ate their pies, and felt fortified for having done so. The taste was phenomenal, unforgettable, amazing. Sarko purchased the remaining ten pies for himself. Arriving at the Kolinovich residence, they saw the gate hanging weakly from its hinges. Furrows all over the property. No glass was in the windows, rather. They were barricaded with wood. Claw marks adorned all of the walls. As though many walls have tried endlessly to gain access to the inside by going directly through the walls themselves. Ansmar greeted them at the door and informed them the favor he needed was actually two favors. This first would be dealing with his father, who had passed the night before. His heart finally giving up from all of the constant attacks and endless nights dealing with the creatures trained to get inside. He explained the creatures have been trained to get to his half-sister, Elena Kolinovich. Srad has come to her in the night, and attempted to charm Arena. As Mark is unsure why Strahd is fixated on her, but he and his father fear that she is close to becoming his. As such, the other favor would be helping to take his sister to Valakia. Where she will surely be safe as the town is walled, has a large guard, and is out of sight of Castle Ravenloft. On the way he explains they will pass a camp of Vistini. If the party expected to leave Barovia, they would need to deal with Strahd. To that end they should seek out the fortune teller Madame Eve at the camp, near Sir Poole. They collected the former burgomaster's coffin, and they take the body up to the church where Father Donovich is waiting with a grave to perform a small service. Marina would stay at the home because, in there, she is apparently safe. While this message seemed cryptic, they would soon enough learn why. Along the way, Ismark explained that the devil strolled, that name again, was enamored with his sister, obsessed with her, though he confessed he is unsure why. The party, all except Pooley, worked to carry the coffin up to Father Donovic's church. He was waiting for them and had a grave prepared. He showed them around the side of the church to the burial site, and while the others helped lower the coffin into the grave, Cooley caught a sound, some stone, pebbles, buncher he cautiously approached, and called out to the others. She stood at good height, clad in a simple breastplate and jerkin, a sword on her hip. Do I not have the right to attend my own father's funeral? Her eyes Mark began to argue in the midday gloom about her safety, and how coming out of the house may have placed her in terrible danger. Then they heard it, walls howling, by the sound of it getting closer. At the father's urging, they rushed into the church itself. They saw Selene coolly and Pursuza barricading the doors with dilapidated pews. Meanwhile, Leon and Sarka took to the bell tower to see if they could spot the wolves approaching. The siblings assisted with the barricades, and Donovich began to pray. 
I mark silently blaming his sister for this misfortune. Oh, father, won't you invite us in? A soft voice danced on the misty air into the church. From the tower, Yun and Sarka spotted a woman in light adventurous garb, well kept and done up with finery, a lute upon her back. Calling to Donovich over and over, then politely asked Sarka to go down and tell him to let her in. He obediently did as he was bidden. Returning to the tower, they all heard the voice of Dora, stirred by all the activity, screaming at his father about how hungry he was. Donovich explained the woman out there was with his son, and the hunter Van Richen when he rallied the people to assault Castle Ravenloft. It would seem her fate was no better than the others. Dora then shouted the worst thing he could have said. Ingrid, come in. The vampire's wick smile at this was cut short, while the wolves, two of which were quite large, charged the doors. Sarko let out a lance of holy light, which struck her high in chest. In spite her grievous wounding, Ingrid turned to the tower and snapped her fingers at the bell. The shatter spell triggered at the bell itself, causing the tower to rock and shake, the bell to explode, and the young and Sarka to take the full brunt of the deafening quake. Inside, Selene braced the door with her weight, and coolly prepped his crossbow, imbuing it with a small flame. Pasuza braced the spell, Ready to unleash it as soon as the doors were breached, he managed to land a bolt in the fallen vampire, but it seemed to cause very little disruption. Sarka, channeling the divinity of Selena, went down the ladder, bathing his cadre in holy moonlight, fortifying them for what came next. The next time Ingrid snapped her fingers, the doors of the church exploded from the shatter spell. As the debris flew in, the walls closely behind, Having as much punishment as the door did from the spell, Pasuzu unleashed a wave of thunderous force. The group quickly dispatched the wolves with blade and bow and spell, sending the vampire carrying off in a flurry of bats toward Castle Ravenloft. Relieved, the group made their way to the Burgomaster's home again, as Mark offering them to stay the night. The second favor, helping take his sister from the town of Barovia all the way to Valaki. A day-long journey if they were swift, he confessed that his sister had been tempted twice by straw, and he believed if he does so again, it will damn her to walk with him forever. Settling into their rooms, and meaning to set guards just in case, the whole group entered a deep and restful sleep. True to their name, the dream pastries made all of them dream wonderful dreams. He was able to loot an entire town. The lock simple, the takings valuable. Puzzles are played for an enormous audience, who worshipped every bang of the drum. Cooley had finally slain the creature he hunted, awashing its blood and the thrill of victory. Selene was finally graduating, top of her class, an accomplished sour warrior, finally. Sarko sat with Selena. She was so proud of her loyal servant, the greatest she had ever had. The dreams kept them in their grip the whole of the evening, and upon waking, all felt the urge to take another slice of pie left over from the day before. All save young partook, and would surely the next night endure such sweet dreams again. Prepping for their journey, they set out rock six in hand, making for Valiki, and the Vistini camp along the way. While the trip itself was rather uneventful, they did pass the disused gallows outside of town. Up upon the scaffold, Pasusa swore his saw the limp body of Cooley swinging from the gibbet. Looking back again, the body was gone, only ravens adorned the grim instrument, not even so much as a rope hung from the mildewed edifice. Once they finally made it to the Vistini camp, they were invited in amongst them. Pasusa, trying to join the revelry around the fire, tripped over his own two feet, and busted a hole in his drum. The few Vistini took him to the side to help repair it. Selene joined in the song, while Leon skulked off to search the camp for Madame Eva. Finding the largest tent in the camp, he snuck inside, and found an old woman sitting at a table adorned with a large silk cloth, 
covering a lump on the table. I have been waiting for you. I am Madam Eve. Where are your friends? They should be here to hear this. Going out and collecting his friends, Ian led them back to Madam Eva's tent. When asking how to leave Barovia, she initially lies, saying the Vistini can sell them portions that all of them to leave. She quickly apologizes, explaining the only way to leave is to be Vistani or kill Strahd. Apparently, long ago when Strahd was mortal, the Vistani helped him back to health after a grievous wound he sustained in battle. For the Kendis they showed him, he promised them they were always welcome to come to Barovia, as it would always be a second home to them. This all owes them, and them alone, freedom to traverse the mists. This all owes them, and them alone, freedom to traverse the mists. Laying them out in a specific pattern, she explains the Tarakadek can be used to find what they need to take on Strahd. First, there are three things Strahd fears above all else. Three relics. Second, they will need help from an enemy of Strahd. Third, they will need to know where they are fated to find Strahd himself. She begins by flipping the first card over, her voice before old and wavering, no, distant and booming, the sound of a conduit speaking prophecy. I see a dead village, drowned by a river, ruled by one who has brought great evil into the world. The tongue of Strahd seems to reside in Beers, that is the only flooded town in Barovia that I know of. Next, you will want the amulet of Ravenkind, flipping the next card over. Her voice goes cold again. Look to the wizard of winds. In wood and sand, a treasure hides. She explains the wizard of winds is the name of the only vineyard here in Barovia, but she confesses not to understand what sand is there. It sits along no beaches. The third and possibly most important relic, the sun salt a weapon of great power that Strahd fears most of all. Flipping over the next card, she coldly states, The treasure lies in a dragon's house, in hands once clean and now corrupted. Argen lost hope. An order of dragon knights came with their great patron, and attempted to end Strahd's reign of terror. They failed and were decimated. She admits she is unsure who would remain, but she tells them where the old hall can be found. You will need a great old eye as well. She draws the fourth card and falls back into that mechanical cadence. Look for an entertaining man with a monkey. This man is more than he seems. She tells them that she is unsure who this means, but she was sure one of the Vistini mentioned a colorful circus cart in Valiki. And of course the Tomica blinks here said to have a pet creature of some kin. Finally, let us see where you will face the evil count. She flips the funnel cord over, and for the last time, speaking in the cold voice of prophecy, see a secret place, a vault of temptation hidden behind a woman of great beauty, the evil waits atop his tower of treasure. Some kind of vault hidden behind a picture, this is the there Isako is working on. She excuses herself, citing how exhausted she is after such a fortune telling, before they leave. Selene asks about the symbol on Edgar's necks, showing her a sketch of it. Her reaction was subtle, but spotted by Selene. Please, we need to know what this means for our friend, she pleaded. One bearing that Mark has no friends, he gave them up. Stay away from Solenka Pass, and no matter what, do not enter the temple beyond it. Many dark things are found there and should be forgotten. If you go to that dark place, you will not return. Ooh. They excuse themselves from the tent, and are told by Irina and Eismark that they need to hurry, lest they not get to Valiki before dark, and they still have a few hours left to march. The trip there was halted by only one weird occurrence. Something wavered in the trees, far back into the thick woods. They decided that getting to town before dark was of greater importance, and moved on toward the gates of Valiki. On arrival, the guard insisted on knowing their business, to which Ismark explained his lofty station, 
and sent them toward the inn. On their way through town, one thing they noticed was all the torches burning everywhere. The light was gone from the sky, but the town burned as bright as daylight. There were also posters for a festival of the blazing sun all over the town. In some spots the papers seemed to be several layers of similar ads stacked on each other. A nearby guard explained to them the festival would be in seven days, and they do this every week or so, by law. Being out of sight of the castle surely helps too, being away from his influence. The guard points them onward at their request, toward the Blue Water Inn. Upon entry to the inn they were all purchased rooms by his mark, and told that they would have a month paid for. This at least, would give them a point of respite while they searched for a way out of Barovia. That night, they all went to bed, and the ones who had eaten their pastries, enjoyed more amazing dreams. Ion and Selene, however, saw something much different in their fitful sleep. 